uh, we are ready to continue the session two of uh, the lecture from Professor Tarun Suradip. So uh, this is the lecture entitled CMB and Large Scale Structure of the Universe. Yeah. Professor Tarun, a time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me continue to my uh, the second lecture I promised. And uh, let me share the screen and get started. Okay, great. Uh, can everyone see my screen? And yes. Okay. Yes, it's clear. Okay. Uh, so this, as I said uh, in the first lecture, I set out uh, how cosmic micro background and observations of the large scale structure in the universe um, kind of join hands and give us uh, a very very precise idea of what the universe is made up of, how it's evolving, and uh, questions like that. But you know, they were all based on certain assumptions. And in the last decade or so, we have slowly started focusing on converting those assumptions into observational facts. Okay, for example, when I started with the large scale structure being isotropic, you know, the distribution of galaxies being isotropic around us, of course, that uh, was probably convincing, but not precise, right? You could see, you could sort of say, oh, we are not sure. But then the microwave background itself, its smoothness it tells you that the universe on very large scales is, you know, homogeneous at the level of 10 parts per million. Similarly, there are certain things, assumptions that were went into my whole uh, inference. So one was I inferred everything uh, with the CMB fluctuation, angular power spectrum being very well understood. I kept saying the physics is very well understood. Physics, once you assume what the physics is, is very well understood, but the questions can be raised as to how do you know there's a plasma screen and there's the acoustic phenomena happening there? You know, after all, this is not a laboratory where you can, you know, see that thing happening right in front of your eyes, but it's something that we infer from data, right? And similarly, the, I told you that uh, from the mildly perturbed universe to the last scale structure we see now, the evolution was through gravitational instability. The fact that Newton's theory of gravity, Shen, had an instability, which even Newton realized that if you have a uniform spread of particles, any tiny perturbation there will start growing. Okay, the denser part will become denser and it will eat away from the rarer parts and those places will become rarer. Okay, this is a known fact. It's like a pencil standing on its head, right? So let us try to see how, what progress we have made there. And these are, what I would call the, are the emerging frontiers in cosmology, because as they solve these questions, they also become extremely useful probes to refine our understanding of the universe. Okay. So let me start first by questioning this entire paradigm of the ambic fluctuations being a result of acoustic phenomena in the plasma at a shift of 1100, right? Now, one way to question that is something that we did ourselves, and that's, I find it very interesting, is suppose I were to give you the measurements of the microwave background uh, fluctuations or the angular power spectrum, measurement of the angular power spectrum, that when you, as long as when you measure, uh, you know, uh, get that from the data, you don't have no theory input in it at all. It's just a measurement of, uh, fluctuations, intensity fluctuations in your uh, detector, right? So you can plot that angular power spectrum. The raw data is shown in gray and ask, suppose I went to an untrained scientist, say a biologist or something who knows how to deal with data, but has no idea of cosmology, no idea that there would be acoustic phenomena or not. Would he or she also infer 
that there is something very interesting about the data. And one of the, this approach is called an agnostic approach, it's called model free approach, okay, model independent approach, right? So we are not assuming that there's an underlying model, Friedman Robertson Walker model, and there's acoustic phenomena there. I'm just giving you these gray points, plot of multipole versus CL. Now, even to an untrained eye, you will see that there are very well-defined peaks. So if I wanted to fit the data with uh, non-parametric plots, uh, non-parametric uh, curves, okay, then still I infer that there are peaks in the data, like this uh, red one and the cyan one and the blue ones are the even uh, odd peaks, first, third, and fifth. This is the second and the fourth and so on. And already, now that I have put those things, this is a model independent measurement of the location of the peak. Now, this is not as refined as the ones that I gave you from the parametric fit, 220 plus minus 0.5. This may be 220 plus minus five. But already you can see that the pattern is very similar. There is uh, there are peaks and the peaks are actually harmonic in the sense that they come under at regular intervals, right? And a way to do that is to plot the location of peak one versus peak two, peak two versus peak three. And this is how it would look, right? It would look like as if I'm looking at a spectra of, or an X-ray diffraction spectra or something like that. You see these distinct spots, right? And even without a model, anyone who knew how to just look at the data in this fashion would have seen, oh, wow, there's an interesting pattern. There is some resonant phenomena because there is some, some repeated, you know, kind of some periodicity in the data, right? And may have inferred that there may be some acoustic physics behind it, or this lends independent support to the acoustic physics. Another way to deal with that is to actually go back and ask, what do we measure in polarization? Remember I told you the polarization measures the velocity field and the temperature measures the intensity field. So now suppose I remember the picture I had of acoustic phenomena was that if I created a spike, then around the spike, there would be a ring, right? So imagine something like that, the velocity flow in that. So I find peaks in my CMB temperature fluctuations, all the hot spots, and stack the polarization pattern around them. Okay, and Planck did that. Uh, and this is what they find. So if I stack all the peaks around the, the, uh, the maps around peaks, and I put them on top of each other, the net polarization pattern looks beautiful like this. You can see that what emerges is actually a polarization pattern. Here, what is shown in color is the E field. And uh, what is shown in stick is the polarization pattern. You can see where it's red, it has got radial pattern. And when it's blue, it has got tangential pattern. Okay, which means the velocity reverses sign here on these scales. So this is exactly what you'd expect in a ripple, okay? So there is velocity coming into the ripple. So outside the ripple, fluid will be flowing into the ripple and inside the ripple also it will be flowing out to the ripple. And that is what is shown here. And this clearly tells you that there's a, that ring with a, around every spot, spot in temperature, there is a ring, which is now easily discernible in the velocity pattern. Okay, the top panel, is the measurement and the bottom panel is the best uh, simulations you can do with it. And you can see the measurements are as good as simulations. And these are things that would enter the textbook because for us, this is the most convincing way to see that the acoustic phenomena that we said should have a linear response, which is shown by that ripple around the spots. I have actually inferred that, and I can almost in the polarization pattern see these rings around hotspots. Now you can do another test. There are rings, 
what would the velocity pattern be around a cold spot where the density is actually very low. So you can stack all the cold spots in the CMB. So those are under dense regions. Now under dense region versus over dense regions, the velocity pattern will switch sign. And you'll see where there is radial pattern, there be you'd expect it to be tangential and the tangential pattern will become radial. And that's what, exactly what you see. Okay, see, I'm going back and forth between stack of hot spots and stack of cold spots. And you can see that the polarization pattern reverses, which means that the velocity field reverses, which is what we expect. If the velocity field is something given a spike in the density, then given a negative spike in the density, you would expect the velocity pattern to reverse. Okay, so that's clearly our uh, strong belief that acoustic phenomena is very well established. And we have much less worries about that being wrong. Now, how about this whole picture of, oh, the universe, the last case structure of the universe started from small perturbations of past, which means there were tiny perturbations. They slowly grew into large scale structure and someone asked about the dark ages. After the dark ages ended, things lit up, but slowly there was already a dark matter distribution. The universe was getting clumpier. Do I see this evolution? Indeed we do, because when we look at the microwave background, you know, so this is the picture we can ask. Uh, so when I look at the microwave background photon, it is actually coming to us through this large scale structure. And as the large scale structure evolves, the density peaks there and the under density peaks, they deflect the photon trajectory by a very, very tiny amount. So the amount is very tiny here. See, for example, if you had a very big over density along the line of sight to the CMB, you would actually see this, the CMB pattern to be very grossly distorted like this. Okay, and these are easy to make out, but you don't have such massive clumps in the universe. But if they were there, then this is what you do. And this pattern you might even see when you see these screensavers where there's a black hole and it's sort of, you know, you show the light bending around a black hole, right? So it's similar light bending here. Light is bent and warped around it. So the CMB patterns will have a distinct pattern around this thing. But the fluctuations there are started being 10 parts in a million, but maybe they were gone to 10 parts in thousand, but still they are not very large. So what kind of deflections do you expect? The deflection you'd expect is the difference between the two maps we are going. So the lens map and unlens map, you see there's a tiny difference where the pattern shift a bit uh, if they are lensed by the large scale structure versus if they are not lensed. And this tiny signal, uh, Planck had the sensitivity and resolution to pick it up and convert these tiny fluctuations that you see due to lensing into a measure of the amount of matter in the, along the line of sight from us to the plasma screen. And they made a map of the integrated mass in every direction of the sky. And this is a very low signal to noise ratio map, but we at least know our, along which directions the universe is over dense and which direction it's under dense. Okay. And this is the first experiment to have measured this weak lensing. And why is it important? We not only see the CMB and get information about the universe when it was half a million years old, but we also see the CMB getting affected by the kind of universe you have along the long line, you know, along its path. And that tells you that there were structures growing, structures existing and growing at the expected rate in that universe. And that can be more quantitatively measured. So I will skip over this, but this exactly is the power spectrum of matter fluctuations, but uh, in angular space, so multi in multiples rather than in the wave number space that I've shown you earlier. And this turnaround that you see in the curve is actually also consistent with the presence of the cosmological constant or the absence of 
matter, uh, clustering matter greater than 0.3, right? So which has to be compensated for by um, matter with a cosmological, uh, with a cosmological constant, okay? So, and this curve is very sensitive to the growth of structures. So we can ask if gravitational instability is working, is it working the way we thought it should? Okay. And this is one indication that yes, this tiny ripples, I mean, some gravitational instability process is underway as the large scale structure is evolving in the universe. And uh, we have very tight correlations between this weak lensing signal and the presence of uh, matter in terms of light reprocessed by stars, early stars, in the cosmic infrared background that I told you about, far infrared background. And you know, I won't get into details of this, but if we stack up the hot spots in the cosmic infrared background where we expect more matter to be there along that line of sight you see that the light coming around it gets lensed in which is what you expect because gravity of that excess density will pull the light towards deflect the light in and this is the deflection field around hot spots or uh, over densities and this is the deflection field around under densities. And you see that at two different frequencies, which is reassuring. And here the deflection is away. So where there are under, uh, under densities, the light, crowd, light uh, beam diverges. And where it is over, an over dense region, the CMB photons converge. And this is measured. These are very small uh, measurements, but these have been done. And you have detected these at about 42 sigma, so with 80% correlation, which are telling you that there is no worries about whether have we got these measurements right in these cases. But the most telling uh, you know, uh, reason we believe that gravitation instability is at work is that remember that there was this acoustic peak uh, in the radiation density at last scattering surface, which is the CMB angular power spectrum, you see the series of peaks, is because of that ring around that spot. Okay, that same spot, you remember the ring was made up of, ring as well as the spot was made up of excess density of photons and also excess density of baryons. Now, if there was an excess density of baryons in rings of 150 megaparsec, is there any chance that we can measure that excess? Okay, because that will kind of nail that I have seen the same thing which I see on the in the universe when it was half a million years old and I see a ring in its radiation, but I know associated with that ring, if the acoustic phenomena and gravitation is stimulated correct, the distribution of matter here on the right, and there are rings here, as I said, and here there should be something similar. And 2004 or five, I was teaching a course to my students in Ayuka. And I sort of said that this is something that is in principle a detectable signal, but you know, it probably is too small to be detected. And in the next week I had to come and tell them, oh no, guys, I was wrong. It has been exact, actually detected. So in SDSS, in a galaxy survey, what you can do is look at peaks of uh, the density field and then compute what is the two point correlation or how the density profile is falling off from there. If there's a peak, the density will fall off and then there will be a bump. Okay, so it would look something like this. And this is what they measured. So you see the measurements in black and if baryons are present at 4%, then the peak would have been this magenta curve and it is the magenta, curve. Uh, it, it is this red curve, sorry, not the magenta. If there was no baryonic physics happening, then it would have been this magenta, magenta curve. But if this acoustic phenomena and gravitational instability was happening, then I have detected the same ripple that I saw in the plasma screen. Now in the galaxy distribution 
in the present universe. And if I infer the scale, it is 105 H inverse. H is around 0.7, so you can easily compute in your head that the scale turns out to be 150 megaparsec. So the same physical length scale that I measured in the microwave background photons, I measure it in the distribution of galaxies. And this is called baryon acoustic oscillation because this is essentially the acoustic signature of the acoustic oscillations that the ordinary matter was undergoing together with the photons at the last scattering surface. And you see that in the density field, right? So this is indeed a very, very subtle signal, okay? Uh, you can see that it's, it's very subtle, but the measurements have become equally good and we have been able to get that. So as I said, in 2005, the first measurement was done. And this itself has become a field of study because it also, you can measure barrier acoustic oscillations in galaxies at different redshifts. And that tells you how the scale should evolve because the expansion factor changes the physical size by the expansion factor. So if I were to able to measure this at redshift of one, then I would get a factor of two. So I would measure the physical size of this acoustic oscillation at 75 megaparsecs. Okay. And this is an undeniable proof that uh, gravitation instability mechanism for structure formation is correct. And also that the initial perturbations are uh, entropic preserving, which is also consistent with our belief in the simplest generic models of inflation. Okay, so this is an amazing thing that we learned in 2005 and it has evolved. So barrier acoustic oscillations has evolved into a really vibrant field in cosmology. And uh, you know, one should pay attention to what it, what's happening. So what is happening there? So suppose I look at the mass profile of this spike. So, you know, basically the spike is here. It's R square, you know, dr. And, you know, you're asking how much matter is there in every annular region. And so this is what the spike is, will look like. So initially when I create the spike, everything is talking to each other. So dark matter, gas, photons, neutrinos, everything has a spike. And this is at a very, very early time, redshift of about 100,000. And then I ask what happens to this spike in my picture. You will find that the neutrinos do not have any coupling to the cold dark matter, neither to radiation. So they start free streaming out. The cold dark matter has no coupling to radiation. However, the gas and photon, baryons and photons are tightly coupled and they move out in this ripple. And at a redshift of 7,000, this is a very strong ripple, stronger than the cold dark matter here, right? And then as time goes on, as you approach that last scattering surface of 1100, redshift of 1100, you see that it has moved almost to that 100 and, uh, you know, 100 megaparsec distance. And then as you go to 1100, you see that it has moved as far as it can, but now the photons and baryons, the CMB photons are too uh, cold to now ionize hydrogen. And then they have started decoupling from the distribution of matter. Hydrogen and helium are becoming neutral. And then the photons free stream away. So this is the thing from which the photons at a peak here get moved a part of the photon distribution moves with the baryons to this distance. And this strength of the peak will depend on the baryon density. And then what happens is the cold dark matter is eight times more uh, abundant than dark matter. So this clump here starts pulling back the baryons here, right? So this peak height starts reducing, whereas the photons now are free streaming just like the neutrinos to give us the CMB. This is the interplay between the cold dark matter. The cold dark matter spreads out a bit, but the baryons are really getting pulled in to the center because of the gravity. And then you can see that the baryons are now more here and then getting lesser here. And by redshift of 10, this 
part is much more dominant than this part around 150. But even if we were to measure the baryon acoustic oxidation redshift of 10, the signal is very strong. Okay, but we are at redshift of zero. By the time we get to redshift of zero, this is a very tiny signal in the baryon distribution. It's actually both there in the baryon distribution and the cold dark matter distribution. But you know, we can measure baryon distribution because we can measure galaxies, we can see galaxies, we can't see the dark matter directly. Okay, so this is an interesting confirmation that our whole picture where we thought we understood the universe very well, assuming acoustic oscillations and gravitational instability, both of these assumptions have been totally checked. Okay. So this tells you that again, you know, I showed you this slide, so let me not get back to it. I can ask now, but we started with the assumption that the universe is isotropic. Now to what level is it statistically isotropic? To what extent is the cosmic microwave fraction, are the cosmic microwave fluctuations in one direction statistically the same as that in the other directions? And this is called paradigm of statistical isotropy. If the universe is homogeneous, then statistical isotropy has to be, uh, you know, it's a predicate of the cosmological principle. If, you know, FRW models are based on the right principle, then you should be able to establish statistical isotropy. By and large, the CMB map looks statistical isotropic. We, you know, see that there is no problem except so if you look at the full sky map there is no sign that there is anything wrong there is any special direction however if i only retain the fluctuations at large angular scales filter this you know smoothen this distribution a full sky map here then i get a low resolution map something like what kobe saw and there something is very visible you can see that if i guide your eye by splitting the sky into two halves, then this half has fluctuations which are much weaker than this half. In fact, quantitatively, there is 14% more power in the fluctuation in this half than other. And you wonder, so does the universe have a direction? Is there a direction in which I can split the CMB sky into a part which has more uh, fluctuation, more stronger fluctuations and uh, weaker fluctuations? And that's a question that needs to be addressed with the full machinery. And uh, one of my research areas has been to address that with a very general technique of something called bipolar spherical harmonics. I won't get into that, but it says that from a CMB map, not only can you get the angular power spectrum, but you can get a hierarchy of other power spectrum called bipost spectra. And this bipost spectra, if they are detectably non-zero, they will signal a violation of statistical isotropy. And we use this to actually look at this thing in very great detail and ask how significant is this? Okay, as a part of the Planck team, we said that this, this is, as I said, amplitude is 7%. Just one sec. Hi, Danishi, I'm in a lecture, I'll call you back. Uh, so this is at 7%, so that means square of that in terms of power is 14%. And the probability to exceed the p-value is about 0 0.006. Okay, so six times in thousand you can, it can happen by chance. That's not very convincing, but it is interesting because what we used to detect this was not a designer statistics, it was a natural measure called the bipost spectra, just like the angular power spectra that we use for all the physics that we infer. And we actually looked at multiple frequencies, as someone asked about the foreground emission. We know that this effect is not coming from foregrounds because we see the effect equally well in at 100 gigahertz, 143 gigahertz, and 217 gigahertz, three different channels of Planck out of the nine, okay? Then more recently, we have done a completely Bayesian estimation of this effect. 
and we have asked what is the Bayesian odd for the universe to be statistically isotropic okay uh, versus having such a violation and we find the odds are about 0.4 in favor of statistical isotropy, which means in favor of a violation of statistical isotropy, there are odds of 2.5. Now, if you give odds of 2.5, no one bets uh, on an odd factor of 2.5. It's just a weak preference and it's, it's not really conclusive. But what is interesting, I find what I find more interesting is the best available CMB data, of course, however, does not rule out a statistically violated CMB map, okay? If, the, if I did the same analysis on a map, which was uh, a simulated map, which was statistically isotropic, I would have got this factor, not, uh, uh, you know, uh, 0.4, but I would have got it at, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, some thousand or something like that, right? Or instead of 2.5, I would have got, you know, 10 to a minus, two or three. So there is something obvious that needs to be followed up, but I wouldn't say that's a big challenge at this point. It's like the Hubble tension, we'll have to wait and see uh, what uh, new data, like the polarization data and the weak lensing maps of the future will reveal for us. And there are interesting things to look for there. Now, finally, as I said, everything pins, and as one of the questioners asked me in the uh, earlier lecture, um, you know, we do have an indication of what the uh, early universe must have been like to create these fluctuations. Okay, so the big question is, most of the science that we have got in, or most of the information we have got in cosmology is from this uh, looking at the mildly perturbed universe on the cosmic screen to the present universe it's seen in the large scale structure, CMB, large scale structure, connecting them through the structure formation via gravitation instability, gave you all the successes of cosmology. But remember, you can always ask the question, who pinged the cosmic drum? Who created those perturbations? And that is another puzzle that is waiting to be totally resolved. There are guesses, but there is no established, experimentally or observationally established uh, theory yet. But our best guess, theoretical idea, are quantum fluctuations during a rapid expansion of the universe called inflation. And these are things that you would be covered by Professor Komatsu in his talk, so I will not spend too much time there. I, we decided that we'll split the thing so that um, all I would say is there are quantum fluctuations that are created here. Quantum fluctuations behave like classical fluctuations because of the same expansion, uh, very rapid expansion, and this is well understood in terms of quantum field theory in curved space time. And these classical perturbations we believe are what we are seeing in the micro background sky. Okay. Now, if this is true, observationally, okay, I should see some reason for that. Okay. So I should see it in the polarization data or I should see it in something more. So at this point, we already see a lot in the temperature, temperature fluctuations. So the fact that these are acoustic peaks. Uh, they have to be driven by some primordial fluctuation. So there has to be a process of primordial that is established. Then if I look at the correlation between the, the power spectrum of the E field, which is the polarization field. Okay, that is also like a wiggly curve here, uh, like, uh, sorry, wiggly curve here, right? And then you can also cross correlate the temperature and the polarization and which is this curve here. And here there is a feature which is on a scale which is larger than the horizon, the larger than the size of the ring. See anything which is the size of the ring could have interacted causally with each other because that's the distance up to which speed sound could have gone and mixed up things. But suppose I go to a room and find that the temperature at one end of the room is the same as the other end of the room. I'll assume that the air conditioning has been on for sufficient time 
to allow uh, the air near the vents and far away from the vents to come to the same thing. But suppose I switch on the AC and immediately find that the temperatures are the same. You know, you wonder well, how did that happen? Because causally this temperature here is low, should be, have been lower because it's closer to the vent, whereas far away it should have been uh, still the normal temperature. So there is one signal here which already shows you that even if it is not inflation, it is something that arranges for correlations on what look like causally unconnected uh, uh, sizes, you know, over distances that seem to be causally unconnected, unless you have a phase of inflation. Phase of inflation can actually explain it. Okay, and this is, uh, is a proof of inflation to some, a strong indication or evidence for some others. Okay, and we have to make this is such a big conclusion that everything that we see in the universe arose out of quantum fluctuations that we have to be very sure. I mean, as someone said, extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence, right? So it's just why, although my friend in the last uh, talk at the end of the talk said, oh, we know that inflation generated, the yes, for most people, we would like to believe that we know the story, but for a hard-nosed observer or the rest of the science community, this will come only when we match it. And then we also have this out of phase thing. So wherever there is a peak in the velocity, which is shown in the peak in the polarization, there's a negative, there's a trough in the density. Now you have encountered this earlier when you did resonance tube experiments, uh, you know, of sound waves, you know that the nodes of the density are the, uh, you know, antinodes of the pressure, right? So similarly, the, here the nodes of density are the antinodes of pressure. And if you remember that calculation there, uh, there was something which was told to you without probably explaining it very well, but it was said, oh, the fluid is adiabatic, okay, which essentially means there are no entropy fluctuations created, which is exactly what is being proved here, that the initial perturbations were not only there, but they were of a particular kind. They were perturbations in density that were not accompanied by perturbations in entropy. Okay, and that is a very, very characteristic uh, prediction of most models of inflation, most generic models of inflation. But the final thing we wanted to see, want to see is in actually the other polarization spectra, the BV polarization spectra. And at this point, we have only upper limits on that. And that one is the power spectra of the BB thing, which is a signature of primordial gravitational waves from inflation, which is like, you know, almost from the origin of the universe. So gravitational waves from the origin of the universe. Okay, so let me summarize. We have very, very strong evidence that something like inflation must have happened because inflation predicts for you that the universe that it will produce will be homogeneous and isotropic. And to the extent we have checked, that is true. There are mild worries here and there, but they are not major enough. It also predicts that the spatial hypersurfaces will be flat. We actually measured that I, in CMB and I showed it to you in my previous lecture that we are very confident to, you know, within 0 0.01 or 0 0.001, that uh, this is flat, right? So you know, it's at a percent uh, level. <clears throat> and we had certain generic predictions about the nature of the primordial perturbations. We expect the power spectrum of power perturbations to be nearly scale invariant. Like there would be the primordial perturbations created such that there was equal power on different length scales. Okay, and that has been verified because we know that we can infer the primordial power spectrum from the data. And we know that it's really close to that. 
and it cannot be exactly scale invariant is also a prediction of inflation and that has been nailed. And I think Akiro's slides uh, I've seen, they will explain to you why that is so, so important. The fact that it is close to scale invariance, but not exactly scale invariant. Exactly scale invariant would have been also a problem for inflation. Then there was this prediction of uh, density perturbations because inflation creates these perturbations. And these perturbations have to be adiabatic. I showed you that we have very good evidence. We also have good evidence for that in the fact that the baryon acoustic oscillations uh, are there at the scale that you expected them to be. They are also there in the polarization map, right? I, and the power polarization power spectrum. The multiple ways we know through the CMB polarization and the baryon acoustic oxidation that there's very little admixture of anything which has entropy fluctuations. You know, this is primarily adiabatic perturbations and that is consistent with the early universe physics, unknown physics of the early universe being something like one of our inflationary models. Then another prediction is that the fluctuations will have a Gaussian statistics. So this CMB field will be what is called a Gaussian random field. And to the extent we have checked, there is no deviation from Gaussianity. Okay, excellent. So the only thing left, and this is just, I think that will convince everyone that we had got the right thing is to see gravitational waves uh, of cosmic origin from the beginning of the universe, the, the inflationary gravitational waves. And the place to look for that is in the microwave background polarization and with higher sensitivity. Okay. And that is a guaranteed signal by theory. Theoretically, the same phenomena of inflation which creates for you the scalar perturbations, which are the density perturbations, is necessarily accompanied by generation of gravitational waves. But what is uncertain, which is model dependent, is the ratio of the gravity wave to the density perturbation strength. Okay, and that is uh, denoted by a number R. And if the day we measure this ratio, which means I measure the gravity wave density, uh, then I will actually also infer the scale, energy scale of this ultra high energy physics. So you can see that this is absolutely a big prize scientific you know, breakthrough that is waiting to happen. And we have slowly, slowly started bringing the value down, right? And we have put, it, put uh, upper limits at the level of 10%. In fact, it's almost at 5% now. Okay, this is a slightly dated slide. So finally, we still have an upper limit. And then there's this quest for the elusive gravitational waves from inflation. Okay, of course, uh, we know gravitational waves exist. And that has been nailed by the measurements of gravitational waves by LIGO. Uh, but gravitational waves of cosmic origin and of quantum mechanical origin is something that is the big prize that the CMB polarization measurements of the future hold for us, okay? And so there are many, many, and also there's a broad consensus in the community that you need a space mission to do that because space is an extremely quiet and interference-free environment. See, when I measure CMB fluctuations on the ground, I look through the atmosphere I can go to high altitudes, I will see less of the atmosphere, but it's not totally gone. The ground itself is a 300 Kelvin, you know, emitter. Okay, so the ground itself is hot and it contaminates your signal. So you have many ways of, of course, re uh, reducing them, but ground measurements have always the uh, disadvantage relative to something you can do from space. But why don't you do only space missions? Because space missions are expensive. So after, there have been many post-Planck proposals for post-Planck missions, uh, both in the European Space Agency and in the at NASA. And they are all, at this point, many of them have not really gone through, but they're being revised. And I can tell you that there is a live uh, proposal which is still under review in India uh, to the Indian Space Research Organization called ECO, which is uh, 
been put forward by a co collaboration called CMB Bharat of Indian cosmologists. I won't get to talk about it much, and but uh, because I also did not want to talk about it because it's not an approved mission yet, right? So it will, we hope that someday it will be approved, but it's not yet. The only approved space mission we have beyond Planck is Lightbird, and uh, I really, really, you know, request you to listen to Akiro's talk, Akiro Konyatsu's talk, because he will talk about Lightbird, the importance of the B modes, how to measure them, and their significance for, you know, kind of, kind of, con giving a concrete support to the inflation idea of inflation. Okay. So as I said, the latest news from January is it has been selected as one of the 31 large priority and we hope it will fly by the end of the decade. But of course, in India, we are hoping that the next major satellite mission would actually be ECO, which would be a multinational uh, multi-agency effort, but launched by ISRO atop its uh, you know, primary uh, prime uh, launcher, the GSLV Mark III, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tarun Suradip. So, uh, this is now the session for question and answer. Anybody who wants to ask question, uh, please uh, tell us your question. Any question? So, Professor Suradip, uh, I want to ask you uh, one question. Uh, the CMB we observe now is the uh, the photon from the recombination era, right? Right. Yeah, about uh, three hundred eighty thousand uh, years after the Big Bang. Yes. So how can we get uh, the evidence of inflation uh, from the CMB signal? That's because the CMB signal that we have, fluctuations that we are measuring must have arisen from some physics. And we have very strong limits because the CMB spectrum is, uh, uh, remember it's black body. Okay, that rules out any such physics being pro proposed in between the redshift of 10 to our seven to 10 to our three, right? So up to, it has to be earlier than a redshift of 10 to our seven. Big Bang nucleosynthesis, if it's correct, rules it out to be even earlier than redshift of, remember as I'm going up in redshift, I'm going further back in time towards Big Bang, okay? So at redshift of a billion, uh, before that, also, you cannot put it because it will upset your Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So it has to be some physics beyond the scales of, uh, you know, uh, tens of MeV or a TeV scale. Okay, and then the question is what scale? If it is at TeV scales, there's very difficult to come up with models because you need to have variogenesis and things like that, which indicate that actually inflation probably happened even you know, when the universe was at an energy scale of 10 to a 16 GeV. Okay, I'm not talking redshift here because these are you know, almost as close to infinity you can think of, right? So at the redshift of 10 to a uh, 16 GeV, you expect grand unified theories uh, to operate and there are ideas where Baryon asymmetry, the fact that we have bar no, don't have baryons and photons in equal measure uh, is kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, is explained by baryogenesis. And then, uh, which means if it is at gut scale, the gravitational wave signal should be measurable. Remember, the ratio was proportional to that. Okay. And we can, with the future measurements like ECO, uh, 
the measure, you know, the CMB Bharat proposal in India uh, can go to down to R of 10 to a minus three. At this point, our limits are at, you know, 0 0.05. Okay. But uh, we can go by a factor of 100 lower. Okay. okay, and then if we don't see a signal, then we start worrying whether inflation is really the mm. uh, idea. Mm. But that is how the CMB plays a role in determining very high energy scale physics because of the fluctuations. Okay, okay, thank you, Professor. So, is there any question from the audience? It's very clear, uh, very clear. Uh, a lecture so okay. that um, everybody understand so they, it seems they have no questions <laughs> yeah also someone has said the whole lecture was super clear actually <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, my yeah. next question professor mm. uh, what kind of measurement do you think uh, it will be uh, needed uh, for the future improvement of our knowledge of our early universe. Do you have any idea? No, so um, this is CMB. Uh, as I said, the search for B modes is one, which will reveal that. Early universe, as I said, one of the things that probes the universe between a redshift of uh, 10 to power three to 10 to power seven is the spectrum of the black body. And that's an area that is opening up where you look at spectral distortions. Because at some level, even our standard cosmological model predicts that there will be deviations from the black body. But they're very tiny at the level of 10 to minus 8. Our limits are at, from viruses at level of 10 to minus 5. But if we can get to the sensitivity, 1,000 times better sensitivity, we will start seeing guaranteed signals. But in going there, if there are unexpected physics that happen, suppose dark matter was made up of decaying particles. Then the decay in the early time, because decay can happen anytime, right? So you, all you know is the half-life time is longer than now so that the dark matter is some, most of the dark matter is stable, but some of them would have decayed and they would affect the equilibrium of the CMB and uh, baryons. And then the CMB will show deviations from black body spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, another, uh, frontier field that's opening up, which is uh, measurements of the CMB spectral distortions. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have any experiments yet. But for example, the, again, the Indian mission proposal has both uh, CMB spectral distortion measurement as well as uh, B mod, uh, CMB B mod measurements, both into it, in it. So it's a very comprehensive mission plan. Hence, it's very expensive too. Expensive. Uh, <laughs> the government is thinking even harder. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, other question from Anton Jailani. So Anton, uh, please ask your question. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your uh, great lecture, Professor. And then maybe my question is uh, related to uh, light bird. So could you tell me what is the main improvement in the light bird? in order to detect a B mode from a primordial uh, gravitational wave. As you showed in your uh, lecture that uh, light bird will be concerned only in uh, low resolution. Oh, How no. come light bird right. can detect a gravitational wave? Right. I think, uh, Anton, I think the best person to answer this uh, is going to speak to you. So mine would be hearsay because Komatsu is one of the leads of Lightbird mission. Mm -hmm. But uh, Lightbird is a very single focus exper uh, you know, mission. It is just designed to measure the gravitational waves from inflation if they exist at some level. It's going to be very challenging for Lightbird because um, it will not have measurements at high ang uh, uh, bet, you know high angular resolution it is a low resolution me measurement it will only go up to multiples of 200 but there are contaminating signals from weak lensing of cmb 
the polarization B modes are created by weak lensing of CIS and which is already seen by many ground based uh, measurements already. The B modes from weak lensing. I didn't want to tell people so as not to confuse them, but B modes at high L's have been measured. But B modes that are relevant for the gravitational wave signal are at a multiple of about 100. But to clean them, you have to make sure no contamination is coming from the B modes of the weak lensing. And that requires an experiment that has both low resolution, low sensitivity at low L's as well as high L's, something like Planck. But these tend to be expensive. Lightbird was uh, designed to be fast and uh, cheap. So that cheap and hence, you know, uh, can be sent off fast uh, and to get this signal. Okay. Uh, but um, there are improvements uh, on the ground from the ground at low L's because first of all, a space mission can see the entire sky. In the ground, you know, you can only from any location on Earth, you cannot see the full sky. You can measure only a part of the sky. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, that is important for low multiples because as I said, the low multiples, the error bars grow because of sample variance. Also, there are a lot of instrumental effects in, as I told you, from ground exper in a ground experiments, which will be absent in space. In space, there is uh, guaranteed temperature stability. Uh, and there is, um, you know, kind of uh, much less, you know, there's no atmospheric, uh, you know, emission and things like that, contaminating the thing. So those are the advantages. Lightbird has the advantage of going to space, but ground-based, so their whole plan, I think, hinges on combining their low L measurements with measurements from ground missions on the high L. Uh, while that would work, but that is always challenging to, measure, to take measurements from two different experiments and try to bring them together because their systematic effects are very different. So this, in principle, looks straightforward, but in practice it is very difficult to make it robust. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for your answer. And maybe uh, about uh, what is the value of a tensor to scalar ratio that to, uh, do you expect from CMB stage four experiment? Yeah, no, stage four, I mean, see, there are now at what is given a forecast and forecasts are things that I, since I've worked with CMB data for a long time, I know forecasts are always off because they don't take into account the real, real problems. There are very, very severe systematic problems. The beams are not symmetric. Uh, the response function is not circularly symmetric. The foregrounds are not as well understood. We, to the extent for the temperature measurement, it was fine because it was a strong signal. Now we will be much below the foregrounds. In the temperature case, we are above the foregrounds. The signal rises above the foregrounds at certain frequencies range. Whereas for polarization at all frequencies and all skies, the uh, signal is below the foregrounds. So you have to be able to remove foregrounds, which are foreground emission. Then there's another contamination, which is the B mode lens due to lensing. And these are going to be extremely difficult. Uh, this will be difficult to anyone, but if you have a comprehensive mission that has a much higher chances of uh, dealing with them, they will be difficult, but not as difficult as what is cur the current situation, which is a combination of a low resolution space with high resolution from ground scenario. But at this time, that is what we have in hand. Okay, thanks, Professor. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else who wants to ask uh, questions, please? No other? Okay, maybe oh, uh, uh, one more question from me. Mm -hmm. uh, you show us uh, the the effect of gravitational lensing to the signal of the uh, CMB. Mm -hmm. so do you think uh, 
uh, the main reason of the gravity lensing is uh, from the dark matter yes. or uh, the from baryon? Uh, which one? Bad, uh, from the dark matter because dark matter is uh, eight times more than baryons in terms of their density. And the density, the Slaska structure of in the universe, you know, the baryons are just lighthouses which light up at mm -hmm. the hot spots of baryon dis uh, or the densest part of the baryon, uh, dark matter distribution. So what we see in that web, cosmic web in galaxies is just kind of spots on actually an underlying skeletal of the web, which is made up of uh, cold dark matter. So most of the weak lensing signal is from cold dark matter. Okay, thank you. Another uh, question from Suruchi Sahi. Uh, so, Suruchi Sahi, please uh, ask your question. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, clear. Because there is, uh, uh, there is so much internet problem, so I'm quite confused. Professor, can you tell us about cosmological constant problem that uh, difference in vacuum energy through cosmology and particle physics problem? Okay. So this has been a problem. I should tell you that cosmological constant problem has been with us for ages. So in fact, when I joined research, I asked a well-known cosmologist, what is the important problem to work on? And in 1991 or whenever I, 1990, I was told, oh, you should work on the cosmological constant problem. At that time, it's not as if we had measured that we had, we knew that the universe is dominated by cosmic constant. But the problem was that uh, vacuum energy is the zero point fluctuation of fields. And we know that there are fields because we know that the electromagnetic field, any other field is quantized. And in the quantum field theory, we know that any quantum field has a non-zero ground state non-zero energy of ground state energy, okay? Now that is dealt with in flat space uh, or a Minkowski space that can be renormalized away because there is no gravitation. It's okay to ignore. It's, it looks like as if I'm just changing the uh, reference point of my potential energy, right? You know that in the, you know, you can always lift, change the, reference point of your potential energy. So it looks like that, but when there is gravitation uh, and we know Einstein's gravity is correct, then even the zero point energy cannot be renormalized away. And that is a problem that remains that we don't know how to deal with these infinities in a very well-defined fashion. We have made a lot of progress in semi-classical quantum gravity, but not more than that. At this point, we know that there is something like a cosmological constant, which is driving the expansion of the universe. And that presents a new problem because earlier we were just trying to get rid of this zero point energy and make it zero. But now it, not, it cannot be zero either. Okay, now the reason it's difficult to make it zero is otherwise it's formally infinity, but it is also actually given by the highest uh, lowest energy scale that you can think of in your problem. So if you have uh, TeV scale physics, then the zero point energy will be at the TeV scale. But we are seeing a zero point energy at 10 to a minus four EV. We don't know any physics that can create that zero point energy thing. And we don't know why that should remain, whereas all the zero point energy of all other fields, which should have been at TAV scale, like the zero point energy of the you know, fields that mediate strong interaction, weak interaction, or even the electromagnetic field should zero out. So this is called the cosmological constant problem. And the problem is very embarrassing. Uh, it's not a small problem. The problem is the predicted vacuum energy uh, density is, orders of magnitude larger, you know, 10 to the 16, 10 to the 60 orders of magnitude larger than what the cosmological constant 
we observed. And theorists don't know anything about it. It's the biggest challenge to theorists as well as uh, observers. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for uh, the question. So is there any other questions? Any other questions? No other questions? Okay, I have uh, other question. This is uh, interesting to know more about uh, the universe. Yeah, so many mysterious things in the universe. So I have another question. So you said that uh, the, the main uh, cause of gravitational lensing of CMD signal is from uh, dark matter. So I'm curious, uh, is there any dark matter mapping in the universe? Yes, so that or, is, sorry. Or, yeah. uh, is the, the large scale structures reflect the, the distribution of dark matter or uh, baryon or both? So, okay. so dark, as I said, the large scale structure is defined by the dark matter distribution. Mm -hmm. When we try to sample it, the galaxies, which is the baryons, actually show you a sample of that. And there's some hot gases we can measure in X-ray, which show you a little more than just the galaxies. But that is just tracing the dark matter distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is just a tracer. So largely the weak lensing does not care about baryons versus dark matter. It sees the total clustered matter and that is what is seen mapped by the weak lensing signal. And the map that I showed you that emerged from the weak lensing uh, from Planck was the integrated dark matter density in mm -hmm. different directions. Now in that is included also the baryons, but that's about a 10%, 16% effect. But most, I mean, it's largely the, you're seeing the cold dark matter distribution around this. Okay. Uh, another uh, question is from Thomas Nabil Taufik. Uh, Thomas, uh, please ask your question. Yes, Professor. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, we said that uh, when we discover the, the tensor modes in the anisotropy, uh, then we, we will be pretty sure from the inflation model. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask, um, will this give us, um, um, uh, will this we will be sure of the inflation, even though we can test one of its direct implication, which is multiverse. Inflation does not necessarily imply multiverse. Multiverse is one possibility of inflation. It's not a necessary consequence, but it's uh, multiverse concept is very difficult to imagine being observationally verified because by definition, these are two universes which have no way to connect. If they're connected somehow by chance, there are people who have looked for such signals. Uh, they were worked by Hiranya Perez, so it looked at if two universe multiverses had collided sometime, they would leave some spots on the CMB sky and they searched for such things. But uh, by and large, it's very difficult to imagine uh, making measurements in one part of the universe and being able to say something which is more than say uh, 50 uh, gigaparsecs away. Okay, so we can say even if we discover the tensor modes, we should probably make our way or rule out the, the models which come up with multiverse, right? No, we won't rule out because we won't say anything about it. You know, if, if it's a, it, it will be inflation that allows for multiverses or it doesn't, necessarily uh, require multiverses, but we cannot say anything about uh, multiverses. Okay, thank you, Professor. Okay, thank you. So is there any other questions from the audience, please? No other? So if there is no other question, maybe uh, we can take a, a photograph again, yeah. once again, uh, so that we have uh, more memory of this uh, very excellent lecture.
Thank you very much. Okay, so wait, let me see. First page. Okay. One, two, next. One, two, third. One, two. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. It's been a thank pleasure. You thank much. you. So, nice talking to you and I'm um, glad I could meet the community. And okay. I hope I can visit you sometime soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Sarani.